Unprecedented security measures across Britain. ISIL has claimed responsibility for the attack at a Manchester concert arena. But can these measures protect so-called soft targets? And is increased security alone the answer? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rochelle Carey. 22 people were killed and 59 others injured, most of them children. One of the victims was an eight-year-old girl who'd gone to the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester with her mother and sister on Monday night. The British government has tightened security and is freeing up nearly 4,000 soldiers to help police if needed. It has also raised the terror alert to the highest level. But will any of these steps prevent further attacks? We'll put that question to our guests in a moment. First, though, Barnaby Phillips has this report from Manchester. This is an unusual sight, but these are unusual times. The British government believes another attack may be imminent, and so public places in Manchester have a higher level of protection. This is the man the police have named as the bomber, Salman Abede, British-born of Libyan descent. But did he have help? And if so, who and where are the people who helped him? The police raided Abede's house looking for answers, and there were three more arrests on Wednesday morning, again in Manchester's southern suburbs. The city, meanwhile, processes its grief. There's much talk of the Manchester spirit, perhaps best captured by a poet at Tuesday night's vigil. This is a place that has been through some hard times. Oppressions, recessions, depressions and dark times. But we keep fighting back with greater Manchester spirit. So what does he want the rest of the world to know about this city? We're a fiercely proud and independent city. Very diverse people. People have come here from around the world to make their home here, to contribute here. My heritage is, is half Irish. And we have a certain attitude, a certain swagger, a certain pride. And we, we're wounded today, we're, we're, we're grieving. People have lost children here, fathers, families, let's not forget that. The risk is there that anger will cause fear and division. The, the people of Manchester are, are bigger than that, they're better than that. They know what the purpose of terrorism is, to divide, and they won't let that, um, let that happen. Um, so there are grounds for hope, and you know, the message I will be repeatedly make, putting out in the next few days is this man was a terrorist, an extremist, not a representative of the Muslim community. Uh, and that message can't be uh, repeated often enough in my view. And as time goes on, we learn more about the victims. They include a 15-year-old girl, Olivia Campbell. Since Tuesday morning, her mother had been appealing for any information. I'm heartbroken at the moment because I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's alive even yet. For all the brave words of unity and reconciliation, the British government will be very worried about what's happened here in Manchester. In recent years, it's had a lot of success in preventing attacks, in foiling plots before they can materialise. Now, they are reacting to events. Manchester in agony, the country unsure of what comes next. Barnaby Phillips, Al Jazeera, Manchester. This is the second attack in the UK that's been claimed by ISIL this year. Five people were killed on March 22nd when British citizen Khaled Massoud drove onto the sidewalk along Westminster Bridge. MI5 raised its security threat level to severe after that attack, so that meant officials thought another attack was highly likely. Now the level is at critical, which is the highest ranking and means an attack is expected imminently. It's only been declared two other times. The last time was a decade ago when multiple car bombs were planted throughout London. Prime Minister Theresa May has said soldiers will now be placed in what she calls key public locations to better protect citizens. Let's bring in our guest now in Manchester, Rizwan Sabir, Assistant Professor in Criminology at Liverpool John Moores University. Rizwan writes extensively on counterterrorism and insurgency, insurgency that is. In Geneva, Andreas Krieg, assistant professor at the Defense Studies Department at King's College London and a specialist on armed groups. And joining us on Skype from Birmingham, Oz Hassan, associate professor at the University of Warwick and a specialist on counterterrorism. Um, welcome to all of you. 
I want to start in Manchester with you, uh, Rizwan. Why do you think this happened in Manchester? Why, why was Manchester chosen and, and why that venue specifically? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a number of reasons as to why Manchester may have been chosen. You could make the point that logistically it was very feasible for this individual to carry a bomb two miles away as opposed to doing a very long stretch to a more strategically important city in political and economic terms, for example, London. Uh, you could also make the point that the uh, fortification of cities like London has essentially meant that individuals will target those cities that are slightly less fortified uh, compared to London. So during the days of uh, armed Irish groups targeting their activities here on the mainland in the UK, uh, outside of London, Birmingham was targeted, then Guildford was hit, and there were a series of actions and operations that were carried out throughout the, the British mainland. And essentially, one of the reasons for that is that particular sites are considered to be so high priority that they're so well protected, and therefore that drives individuals to try and target slightly less protected sites, as we can see uh, the case in this instance. Oz, can you compare and contrast um, Manchester, the environment in Manchester, with with Birmingham? Yeah, I mean, Manchester has, in terms of population, about 9% of the population is Muslim at the last consensus. And that population is quite diversely spread out throughout the city. If you compare that to, say, Birmingham, Birmingham has a 22% uh, population that I self-identify as, as Muslim, certainly at the last 2011 consensus. Um, and part of that is that that concentration is also, equal, you know, very highly densely concentrated um, in in the sort of central eastern part of the city. So in that sense, it's quite unusual it, it, that, that Manchester would be targeted in this, in this way by someone who is Muslim in this way because of the manner in which actually the Muslim population in Manchester is actually very well assimilated and integrated, which is slightly different to what happens, it happens in Birmingham, which is, is slightly more multicultural but ghettoized. Um, Andreas, I saw you nodding your head there. If you want to add something to what Oz was saying, please do. And, and also, if you could address the fact that wh whether or not you think it's likely that the person who did this is part of a larger network. Yeah, I completely agree. I think um, exactly what uh, the previous uh, speaker said. Uh, you have a lot of ghettoization in Birmingham that you don't have in Manchester. And Manchester, especially the Libyan community there, is very well integrated. So it's very, a this family that the, uh, the perpetrator came from, the attacker came from, is a very atypical Libyan family in that environment because they are apparently really religious and quite radicalized, adhering to a Salafi uh, form of, of Islam. Now, um, Yesterday, we didn't see any claims yet from ISIS that, we, that he was a, a soldier or a martyr until very late during the day. So initially, we thought he might have been a lone wolf, somewhat indirectly inspired by ISIS. But now it shows that he had had uh, some connections with ISIS because he's been traveling the region. He's Libyan. He had been back in Libya since 2011 a couple of times, just recently three weeks ago. He's been to Syria. So it's very likely that even if he had, didn't have direct uh, contact with ISIS as such, he definitely had some contact with jihadist groups of different flavors that exist in Libya as well. Um, and then obviously, if you think at the sophistication of the bomb, the more we learn about it, TATP, which is the explosives that were used there, are very commonly used by, by, by groups to uh, building IEDs. They have been used all over the Middle East. Um, but then also using nuts and bolts to make it even more vicious and cause more, uh, more havoc among, amongst uh, people in Manchester. All this kind of points into the direction that he definitely had support from, from outside. Um, and then obviously there is the question of whether he built the bomb himself or whether he was given the bomb by a network within the UK. So the more we look at it, the more it seems like he's part of this network. Also the reason why the UK uh, authorities are now putting the uh, alarm level to critical, the terrorist uh, threat level to critical, is because they actually believe that the people who are behind this, the network is still active and operating, and they are now really under pressure to find them, not just in the UK, not just in Manchester, but across Europe, because this is a transnational global network, or definitely a regional network, 
um, and make sure that these people don't carry out successive attacks, which is somewhat linked to it. Uh, and that kind of begs the question of, um, you know, were the actually were these uh, were the authorities well prepared for this or not? Rizwan, um, Andreas makes a, a, a very good point. There's a lot of pressure on the government in, in the UK to make sure that another attack doesn't happen. And clearly it seems that one of the ways they've chosen to respond to that is by authorizing the use of, of more military to assist the, the police and law enforcement if necessary. What does that really do, in your opinion? I think the first very important point to recognize is that we here are in the midst of a general election at the moment, which has had to be largely suspended, especially on, in terms of media discourse and coverage. And secondly, the deployment of the military can't be necessarily seen in too much isolation from that particular general election. And let me just qualify what I mean by that. So the decision to deploy the armed forces here on the streets of the UK to protect critical national infrastructure, transportation hubs, and civilian and tourist sites is undertaken through the framework of military aid to civil power. MACP. And what this uh, framework is based on is an executive governmental political decision to deploy the army after a, re a request is made from a, a particular government agency or police service. In this case, the police made the request. So the person who's authorizing the deployment of armed British personnel on the streets uh, here in the UK, a thousand of them almost, is actually a, a politician a conservative politician fighting a general election campaign. I think this is a very important political context to consider uh, with the actual deployment of the troops here. Secondly, I think it shows something uh, just as important, and, and that is that they are not willing here to tie up all of their resources that they have, the specialist firearm officers belonging to the police and law enforcement agencies, and they therefore want to draft in additional support so they can undertake and execute any warrants or operations in a more diverse and widespread way. When we talk about putting more law enforcement, more, more military, um, Alfair, Oz, what kind of pressure, what could that mean for the life of, of anyone who looks brown in the UK, specifically maybe in, in a place like Birmingham? Well, I think the important point here that, that was perhaps just missed is that the military, because of their experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, they have had to deal with scenarios of split-second decisions against suicide bombers coming up and targeting places. So they have a certain expertise that they lend, which is why they have been put in strategic locations near Parliament, um, near uh, St Paul's uh, Cathedral and things like that, you know, these, these sort of softer uh, tourist sites. Um, in terms of, you know, being brown, um, it's... There is, there is a palpable sense in which often those communities can feel isolated and segregated because of policies like prevent um, and the way in which, you know, the, the, these communities can be seen to sort of be, be sort of singled out in the Muslim community especially. But that comes with certain dangers, you know, um, that, that we've already seen, you know, John, the, John Charles de, de Menendez. Um, shooting on the tube back, back after uh, the 7 7 bombings um, shows that people can get a bit twitchy. So, in terms of sort of what this does, there will be pressure put on these communities. But equally, it's very important to point out that with the Manchester attack, the, the communities that have really stepped forward are people in the Muslim community, people who are, you know, whether they be taxi drivers, people who work in the National Health Service. Um, various civil society groups that have stepped forward. Um, and so th there's been a very large sort of emphasis on the fact that the, the folks who have carried out this attack just simply don't represent that community. And actually that coming together is helping um, sort of alleviate some of the pains and pressures that these attacks have caused. Uh, Andreas, would you, um, would you agree with that, the, the role that the Muslim community is actually playing in, in, in gathering in intelligence, I guess, is the word I would use for this. And what do you think has been working and where do you see flaws? Exactly. I think 
the UK is probably the number one country after Israel when it comes to dealing with terrorism. They have had an experience of over 40 years of dealing with terrorism and developing a policy against it, and one which is not very, which is very soft. It's, it's not the same heavy-handed approach that we see in the United States and, 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 or in continental Europe. It's one that is very much based on intelligence gathering and building up good relationships with the communities where potential people, potential attackers come from. And I think if you look at, um, if you look at what happened in, in Manchester, um, the UK authorities, the MI5 uh, and other uh, authorities, had very good working relationship with local communities, especially with the local, uh, local mosque. And I think he, that's where um, the, the attacker was already flagged up by people in the mosque who said he actually radicalized and to such an extent that he's not susceptible anymore to any alternative narratives and views, which is very important. So it's, it's all about prevent. It's not about putting people on the street and alienating them. So it's trying to bring them in. And this is what the UK uh, CT or counterterrorism policy has always been about. It's about multiculturalism. It's about letting people live, live and let live and not alienating communities. And that also means um, trying not to intervene when you don't have to intervene. So let people carry on with it. But everything happens behind scenes. So intelligence gathering relies on CCTV. It relies on all kinds of technology that allows uh, intelligence services to actually track people, track their conversations, um, which some people have flagged up, especially liberals have flagged up and said, this is not democratic, uh, this is against liberalism. But really, at some point, you have, the, you have to make the choice between more security or more liberalism. And the UK, I think, has found quite a good balance where effectively on the street you don't see too many heavy-handed and too heavily armed people uh, walking the streets. Everything happens behind the scenes. And most of the time, a lot of the attacks have been thwarted uh, or have been, a lot of the plots have been foiled quite effectively in the UK uh, without the public knowing. And, and in that way, that, that also provides people with a sense of security. Um, so if you now put the military on the the streets that kind of has an impact on the on the security feeling on the sentiments of security within not just in these communities in general within British society and that is something you only do at the very last step when you actually know that uh, a threat might be imminent. Rizwan do, do you agree with that that there has to be a choice between um, more security or or civil liberties? I think as a democratic nation, there needs to be an element of proportionality. And I think that the focus in the United Kingdom certainly has been one in which the attention and concentration has been towards a sense of exceptionalism and overzealousness. So if we jog back to 16 years ago, the attacks of 9-11 and go forward that way, what we essentially see is the use of internment, the detention of a, of a number of North African, Algerian, Libyan uh, uh, individuals being detained and held for a, a year or even more without given the right to uh, go to court, without being charged for a, a criminal offence or being given the safeguards of due process. Then we have control orders, a form of house arrest, secret evidence, secret courts, individuals being prosecuted for holding information without any criminal intent being required uh, for the courts to send them to prison. So what we have here, and of course the Prevent Countering Violent Extremism program, which has done so much to generate mistrust of law enforcement and uh, the British state more broadly amongst the Muslim community because of this sense that this program is there to conduct surveillance. And indeed it is there to conduct surveillance, only that this surveillance is overt and undertaken through community neighbourhood policing mechanisms and frameworks. And what this process has essentially done is, is demonstrated that counter-terrorism is opting more for a state of exceptionalism and increased security lot rather than liberty. Now, of course, it's easy for the general population to get up and say, we feel secure because of uh, the fact that these uh, exceptional measures, or as Tony Blair described, the rules of the games have, uh, uh, have changed. But if you go into Muslim communities up and down the United Kingdom and you speak with them, there is a sense of dread and there is a sense of fear. Indeed, I myself was afraid for some strange reason that my door would be broken down by counter-terrorism police officers because I do indeed hold some ideas and viewpoints that some people consider to be too radical. So there is a sense of fear and distrust of law enforcement and British security policy. And I think that that policy and infrastructure has aired too 
much unfortunately on the side of militarism and exceptionalism and the way out of that the way towards generating security and trust is to move away from that exceptional model and to go back to the drawing board and recognize that we have a very sophisticated a very historically precedented system of legal powers that we can use to deal with individuals involved in political violence through the ordinary criminal process let's not lionize them let's not make them into martyrs let's deal with them as we do with any other form of criminality Oz, do you think that there's too much focus on dealing with this after the fact as opposed to getting to the root causes? I think in large part, yes, um, because one of the th issues around terrorism is that you know, these aren't sort of arbitrary acts in and of themselves per se in that often terrorism is, a, is motivated by political causes. In the case of IS, it's motivated by political causes and foreign policy issues and the stability of Syria and Iraq. Um, so getting to a solution sort of abroad is what is going to help us counter terrorism here in the long term. We need, effectively, we need a political solution to this. Um, in terms of what was just said, I mean, it's important to point out that Prevent, although it was targeted and, you know, in, in large part was conceived around Islamic terrorism. One of the things that we've discovered with Prevent is that it's actually picking up far more right-wing extremism in the UK and right-wing extremists like such as the person who sort of shot Joe Cox MP than, than was originally thought. So there are sort of, it's not just the Muslim community that this is catching. In fact, it's catching far more right-wing right, right, right extremists. The other sort of part of this to sort of put into perspective is that historically, if you look at, you know, where we are with terrorism, although we're in a period where terrorism is sensationalised, you're actually far less likely to be um, subject to a terrorist attack or to die from a terrorist attack than you were, say, in the 1970s. So, proportionally, there's far less risk. Okay, well, yet... can, I, can, I, can I stop you on that for just a moment, though? Uh, that's true. The facts do state that, but if, but if people's... Um, way of living and their mindset does not allow them to believe that, does that mean it's working? Well, I think this is, this is the precise point, is that the forms of terrorism that are operating now are, are designed deliberately to capture media attention. They are deliberately designed to, to sensationalize certain activities. Um, you know, let's sort of put it into, let's make a contrast with Manchester, for example. In 1996, Manchester was subjected to a, a terrorist attack that blew um, a, a lorry attack that, that caused £1.2 billion uh, pounds worth of damage, had around 200 um, injuries. Now, that was obviously a catastrophic attack it, at the, at the time. Now, what's happening now is that you've got one individual with an owl bomb who has caused, you know, considerable harm. Um, but actually, he has been able to capture the, the media's attention and sort of tie it into this sort of Islamic narrative in quite a, an efficient way, which is exactly what IS want, because they want to invoke a clash of civilizations. And what we need to do is find out a way around this, how, you know, we need to be far more conscious how we report these things, how we sort of talk about these things and sort of put these things into perspective. Because having a rational approach to terrorism is going to be far more sensible for finding a solution than having an emotive one. Oz, that is going to be the final word um, on this discussion. I think you're saying that we all need to do a little bit of reflecting um, and perhaps evolve on how we um, deal with these things. And um, that'll be the final word. Thank you all for joining me for this, um, for this conversation. I appreciate it. Rizwan Sabir, Andreas Krieg, and Oz Hassan. Thank you all very much. And thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime. Go to our website. It's aljazeera.com. To join the discussion, check out our Facebook page as well. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And of course, there is always Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rochelle Carey, and the entire team here, bye for now.